Hey, Internet and Melee. I'm Casey. This is 25 and 52. And today we're going to talk about political realignment. Today is Martin Luther King Jr. Day, a day on which Americans from across the country uh, co opt the legacy of a revolutionary, radical, complex man to sell everything from porn to political ideologies that harm the very people that King sought to help. Uh, it's a really good day to not spend a lot of time on the internet. And as on all such occasions in America where we're talking about race publicly, uh, there are a lot of really ahistorical concepts getting thrown around. And the one that irritates me the most Maybe. The one I'm going to talk about is this idea that Republicans can't be racists because they're the party of Lincoln. So, leaving aside that, one, that's not how racism works, and two, Lincoln himself wasn't exactly not racist. Um, leaving that aside, we have this problem of what is a political party and can you rightly say that someone who was president that far in the past was a member of the same party as exists today. Very, very first of all, it should be obvious that political parties change over time by the fact that we don't have the same political parties today as we did when this country was founded. We've had Whigs and Federalists and Democratic Republicans and Democrats and Republicans and Bull Mooses and this, that, and the other, right? We've had a lot of parties, though for a long time it has been pretty much Democrats and Republicans running the show. But clearly, parties aren't static things because if they were, we would have started with two and continued to have two, but we started with kind of none and have like two major ones and a couple of like big minor ones and then a bunch of little ones, it's actually not as simple as you're probably led to believe. But the thing that I really want to talk about is that even once a political party is founded, it doesn't stay the same. Um, so I'm going to talk for a little while about the process that is called realignment. And everything that I'm going to say from here on out draws on the scholarship of V.O. Key and James Sundquist and the wonderful instruction of Alec Lamus that I received during my undergraduate education. Um, so credit given, this is a bare bones explanation of political realignment theory without getting into any of the details of when the ones in America happened. Okay? So, you have a population. In this particular instance, we're going to represent a population with a square. Okay, you have a population, they live in a city, they, well, not a city, like a little village, right? And they're farming and kind of sustaining themselves, right? And they're governing themselves and they're having a democracy. And then somebody has the idea, oh, hey, you know what we should do? We should build a new library, right? And this population is divided. Some people say that a library will be great, it will enhance education in the community, and some people say that it's a waste of money and, you know, they need to be focused on farming their crops or whatever the argument against a library is in this particular situation. So this cuts our population in half, right? We have here the creation of a, a two-party system um, and these groups are split like this and they will vote kind of along these lines for a while. They either build or do not build a library but based on that past experience they'll stay until there's another major conflict. So say a little while down the road they don't build the library and somebody says, well, you know, we have this income, why don't we build an irrigation system for our 
farms. And this cuts it in a different way, right? So now I'll cut this way instead, right? So you'll see here and here populations that may have switched. And so now it's hard to pick based on parties who supports what. And it gets further and further complicated from there, and clearly the government of the United States doesn't exist on a, like, will we build a library or not level of politics, right? There's like 27,000 things happening at all time. But that's the basic concept. People switch parties based on divisive issues. This happens over a period of time, um, and there are typically considered to be, you know, elections that are tipping points at which coalitions that have been parties change from, you know, they, they pull apart and then reassemble themselves, right? So that's kind of realignment 101. So to talk specifics, just really briefly, we've got four elections in which this changing really, really happened, maybe five. So 1860, you get Abraham Lincoln elected, you get a coalition that is built around um, people with a free labor ideology, soldiers and veterans. Um, it's very northern, it's very industrial, um, and that plays out a little bit later. Things happen, we get to 1896, um, William McKinley gets elected, and we're not really thinking about the issues that the parties were divided on in Civil War era politics. We're thinking economics and we have um, industry, businesses getting involved at levels that they'd never been involved before. So industry sides with Republican William McKinley while Democrat William Jennings Bryant becomes increasingly populist, kind of setting the stage for what will continue to happen. In 1932, um, after kind of the collapse of our economic system, we have the election of FDR and the creation of a whole new arrangement of American politics with um, previously like non-involved and really divided groups becoming the New Deal coalition. So you've got unions and Catholics and Jewish people, you've got um, big city machines, you've got just you know, rural folks, just an increasing number of people coming together into this weird New Deal coalition. This happens, the world continues. We get to 1964, Lyndon Johnson is elected um, overwhelmingly for a variety of reasons, and I won't let myself get into that because I really think that election is terribly interesting. Um, but Lyndon Johnson is elected, and you have, if you look at the numbers, something interesting happening here. You have um, an increasing number of African Americans identifying as Democrats. You have kind of the old New Deal coalition um, holding together, and so Johnson is still getting a lot of votes in um, places that are now very strongly Republican, uh, particularly the South, right? So you have that happening, but Johnson and the Great Society and his actually very progressive domestic policy really solidify this switch where the party that is assumed to care about African Americans becomes the Democratic Party instead of the Republican Party. And what puts the seal on that really is the 68 election in which Nixon uses the Southern strategy, which is about pushing the, the states' rights stuff in a really like dog whistly like states have the right to be really racist if they feel like it way. You get a, a consolidation there, and that's really where I think any sense of being able to say that Republicans are the party of Lincoln kind of goes away, because really no party is the party of Lincoln. The stuff's been cut up and moved around so many times, um, it would be equally false for Democrats to claim to be the party of Lincoln, because we're also not that. Um, so that happens, and like in the 80s you get Reagan and all of this welfare queen stuff, and it's just entirely ahistorical to say that Republicans are the party of Lincoln, and also that's not how racism works, and also Lincoln was also kind of a racist. That's what I have to say today. I love you. Bye. Okay, no, that's not everything. Um, 
I, again, want to say that if you want to read more about this, there are lots of really wonderful and interesting books. Um, I want to, again, give a shout out to the late Alec Lamus, who uh, taught me all of this stuff. Um, and I want to send lots of love and care to all of you um, in the spirit of community. I hope we learned something together today. If you have any questions, I'd love to talk about this. Bye.